Okay, let's get started. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day for joining us for today's CNCF webinar, The Truth About the Service Mesh Data Plane. I'm Jerry Fallon, and I would like to welcome our presenter today, Dennis Janot, Director of Field Engineering at Solo.io. And I would also like to welcome Betty Janod, VP of Marketing at Solo.io. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you are not able to talk as an attendee. There is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, so please feel free to drop your questions in there and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. This is an official webinar of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of the Code of Conduct. Please be respectful of your fellow participants and presenters. And please also note that the recording and slides will be posted later today to the CNCF webinar page at cncf.io slash webinars. And with that, I'll hand it over to Dennis for today's presentation. Thanks. Uh, I don't know, Betty, you wanted to do a quick introduction or I'm going to start now? I think you can go ahead and start. Okay, good. So hi everyone. So thanks for the uh, introduction. Um, mm -hmm. So I am like uh, Denis Jano, Director of Field Engineering at Solo.io covering uh, EMEA. You can find some of my contact details here if you want to, to contact me. And um, here what I'm going to do, I'm going to start with like uh, a discussion about, you know, where what, the evolution from monolith to service mesh. And obviously a lot of talk, you know, start with this uh, discussion about uh, how we go from monolith to microservices. But that's just the first step uh, in this journey to the, the service mesh. So obviously, the reason why people go from monolith to microservices is because they want to be able to release different components uh, with different schedules. They want to scale uh, these different components, uh, different microservices independently. And uh, also what I would say is now common is that uh, when you uh, develop new microservices, you will probably uh, run them on Kubernetes. And uh, I assume if you are uh, listening to this uh, CNCF webinar, uh, you are probably already using Kubernetes as well. And then when uh, you uh, run these microservices on Kubernetes, you uh, very quickly need to expose some of them to the outside world. And uh, a common way to do that, obviously, the first thing you try out generally is using an ingress. So you make sure you have an ingress controller uh, configured on your Kubernetes cluster that can be, I don't know, Nginx or traffic or whichever else. And then you can use uh, create ingress objects so that you define how you want to expose these uh, microservices. You can use some annotations. If you want to use like uh, TLS, you can you know define the certificate you want to use. You have some basic routing uh, options as well, but uh, obviously it's uh, quickly very limited. And uh, when you want to um, do more at the gateway level, uh, then you need to really uh, take a look at uh, a true API gateway. Uh, because one of the things we see as well when people start to create microservices that they want to handle the application logic in the microservices, but they want to put the rest of the logic out of it. So for example, um, if I want to authenticate with uh, an uh, OIDC, I don't want each microservice to implement that feature. Instead, I want to implement the feature in the API gateway. And I want the API gateway to be smart enough so that it can authenticate for me, and then it can pass information about the user to these microservices. And sometimes you can even configure it in a way that it will, you, you can have like some authorization policies like based on OPA or, or other uh, mechanism to define if you want to accept or, or uh, reject the uh, request. But you can do much more with the API gateway. You can also um, run deploy this API gateway in Kubernetes and then use it to send some requests to services that are still running in VM, for example. Or you can 
uh, send some of the requests to Lambda functions in AWS, for example. So you, you can do a lot of different things with, uh, with an API gateway. So that's really good when you want to secure the edge when, uh, and, and that's generally the first step. You know, when you start to deploy microservices and Kubernetes, then the first step is how I expose my services to the outside world. But then the next step is how I enhance the service to service communications. How I, 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 I you know, take advantage of uh, the infrastructure or something else to, uh, to be able to, uh, for example, encrypt communication between my microservices. Um, and, and I mean, you have a list of requirements. That's not a full list, but I think that's a good beginning. You know, how I, I'm able to manage identity so that when one service talks to another service, they know uh, they can trust uh, the identity of the other service. Uh, you want to do like certificate management, especially you want to be able to rotate certificates. I mean, it's not something that is very easy to do. Uh, so you don't want to do that manually. Uh, you, you want like to be able to have like some uh, special way of managing the traffic, like doing like canary deployments or blue green deployments or something like that. You want to be able to manage like access control. Uh, you, you want to also to get like some insight about what's going on, which microservice talk to which microservice and so on. If you just use Kubernetes, you get something like that. So you get this notion of a Kubernetes service where you can use labels to take some decision about you know, the traffic, uh, but it's very limited. You can obviously do some else check, but again, like it's, it's, it's really limited. And uh, when you want to do encryption, uh, then it has to be done at the application level. So you need to you know, agree how these microservices will uh, encrypt the communication, if it will be like a one-way encryption or mutual TLS or things like that. And then for all the other requirements we discussed about, you need to, uh, to find third-party software that will allow you to manage access control or telemetry or you know, manage certificates and things like that. So obviously, uh, just Kubernetes alone doesn't do much for you. Uh, another approach is to take the approach that has been um, used for some time. And uh, especially when people were not running microservices on Kubernetes, uh, there was this approach of using an API gateway, not for the edge, but for service to service communication. And in fact, it's true that you can do more that way. You can manage some you know, access control, you can uh, transform your requests, you can get some you know, telemetry data about you know, what's going on between your services, but you cannot do everything. I mean, like it doesn't solve the encryption problem, like the end-to-end -end encryption. Uh, it doesn't solve like, uh, you know, the way you rotate your certificates and things like that. But the main issue with this approach is really that it becomes quickly a bottleneck. And you don't want, like, I, I have microservices, I can now scale my pods independently, but everything goes through an API gateway. So that doesn't really make sense. And that's why, uh, the service mesh uh, appeared. And the idea of a service mesh is really to separate the control plane from the data plane. So on one side, you have the control plane where uh, you will uh, define rules. And then you have the data plane where you will enforce the rules. And uh, as you can see here, I can use the control plane you know, to manage you know, identity and you know, certificates and things like that. And then I enforce that using this uh, notion of a, of a sidecar proxy. So what it means is that every time I start a pod, I have like an additional container running in this pod that runs a proxy. And because now I have this proxy running on all the pods, when the pods communicate together, uh, they can uh, under the encryption, for example. So like there is a, a plain HTTP request from this service to this service, but it's encrypted in the middle by the proxy that um, agreed on their identity and that uh, started to you know, put in place MTLS and things like that. And because all the traffic goes through this sidecar proxy, you can get some telemetry data and you can know more about 
which service talk to which service. Uh, you can create a map out of that. You can, you know, you know how many uh, errors that you got, you know, during this communication and, and so on. And uh, here you probably recognized Envoy, the logo of Envoy here. And it's not a hazard because it's, it's by far the, the most popular way uh, or the most popular proxy uh, in a service mesh deployment. So all the service mesh uh, technologies are not equal. Uh, they are not all based on uh, sidecar proxy, but most of them are. So I think that there is a, a large consensus that uh, the overhead that you pay for uh, running a sidecar proxy with each pod is uh, it's really worth paying it. This overhead it's not a huge overhead; it's very small, and it get it give you so many benefits that really became now uh, the standard way of building a mesh. Uh, then you have some differences from one mesh to another. Like if you look at uh, uh, console connect, for example, instead of having a single control plane, you would have that component running as a daemon set. So you have like multiple instances of it uh, on each node. Um, they don't force, they, they don't, it doesn't come with Envoy, but it allows you to use Envoy because definitely uh, a lot of people are going that direction. And that's also what you see in Linkerd. That's what you see in Istio, which is uh, today uh, the most popular um, service mesh uh, technology. And why you see Envoy all the time? It's because first of all, it's part of uh, the CNCF. I assume you know what the CNCF is if you, you are watching this webinar, but obviously being part of a neutral foundation is something uh, very interesting. The other reason why it's so popular is because, I mean, it's proven at scale running on many um, environments, it provides a lot of performance. I mean, you can get like thousands of requests per second handled by like a single instance of Envoy. But also what's very interesting, it has been really designed to be driven by API. So it has been designed to be driven by a control plane. So Envoy is a data plane and you define your configuration somewhere else and you apply it uh, with, uh, with an API which makes a lot of sense for um, service mesh, obviously, as, as we've seen uh, just before. So now what are the, the, the most common challenges with service mesh? I, I, you have many, but I, I'll focus on a few. So one is like, uh, which one to choose? And I think I already addressed that point uh, just before. You know, I've said that uh, there are multiple options. But obviously when uh, you look at the right option, uh, I, I would say that uh, first of all, finding one that is based on Envoy uh, is probably uh, a good choice, even if now it's kind of most of them. And uh, then like you have some service mesh technologies that are like pushed by one vendor and some that are like more like pushed by neutral foundations. And uh, in the, the second case, then the question is who is going to support it? Like, so you have this nice um, open source uh, service mesh technologies. The, the most common one is definitely Istio. Now it's like, who's going to support it? Like, because you need to have someone helping you to define what the best way to deploy your service mesh, but also um, when something is going wrong, you need to have a company with some expertise at different levels, including Envoy, so that they can help you understand what, what's wrong. So, so that's, that's really something important, like how, how you're going to, to get support for it. Um, then how you will be able to, um, to use it with your existing microservices, because as I said, a lot of things are now handled by uh, the service mesh, but it doesn't mean that there is no, nothing you have to do on the application side. Sometimes you just run your application and it works, but sometimes you have to, uh, to, to test really carefully so that uh, you understand uh, some problem that can occur. For example, like a, a very typical issue is when uh, you have different timeouts. So in, in Istio, for example, you can define like timeouts for your request 
but you also have very often timeouts defined in your application. So if these timeouts uh, um, are conflicting, then it can create some very strange issue, very difficult to debug. So you really need to understand um, what uh, timeout circuit breaking and stuff like that are implemented in your application before you move it in, in your service mesh. Also, um, it's quite rare that uh, everything will run in the mesh. So you will have like some of your microservices running in the mesh, but you will still have these microservices still need to, to communicate with other services that are not in the mesh. And they can or they can run on like in a virtual machine, they can run like in even in bar metal. So you need to understand that and you need to 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 think about the strategy for, for these uh, environments. And, uh, and the last challenge, which is the one I will go a little bit deeper on, uh, is uh, how do I manage multiple clusters? And the reason why I will cover that uh, with more detail is because, first of all, it's a very common challenge that we hear from users, how I'm able to handle you know, cross-cluster communications. And the second reason is that I even see sometimes users that go serve to service mesh, they want to adopt service mesh just because of that, because they want a way for microservices on different clusters to communicate together. So what you want to do is something like that. You want to have like different Kubernetes clusters, let's say, uh, that uh, runs in different regions, perhaps even different cloud provider or one in a cloud, one on premise or two on premise in different data centers, for example. And you want to uh, allow uh, a service in this, uh, mesh on the left to communicate with the service uh, in the mesh on the right. And that's, that's challenging. There are many challenges. Uh, the first one is about identity. So the way uh, service mesh, like I'll, I'll take the example of Istio here. So the way uh, Istio works is that you have this uh, unique identity uh, for each um, service that is based on uh, Spiffy. So you get what we call a spiffy ID. And the spiffy ID is based on uh, the service account of the pod. So basically the first best practice is you need to have one service account for each uh, service so that you can have each service as its own identity. So you get like um, this spiffy ID and the spiffy ID in uh, Istio start by the trust domain slash ns slash namespace slash sa slash the service account. So first of all, the first is trust domain. And the trust domain in Istio uh, by default is cluster.local. So if you deploy two um, different service mesh based on Istio, then they will have the same trust domain. So if I have the same service account name in the same namespace in two different clusters, the pods that are using these service accounts have the same identity on the two clusters, which is a problem if I want to have some global access control or things like that. So the first thing you need to fix is you need to make sure you have different trust domain, one trust domain per cluster. And then you need to, to, to make sure that you can secure the communication uh, with a, you know, mutual TLS. And to do that, uh, you need this, um, pod here, or the proxy in this pod, to be able to um, start MTLS communication with this one here. So it needs to validate the certificate of this one, and this one needs to validate the certificate of this one. Here, it's possible to do that natively because both certificates have been signed by the same uh, CA cert in this cluster, in this mesh. But if this one, wants to validate the certificate of this one here, then there is an issue because they have different CA certificates. So the first thing you need to do, you need to federate the identity. You need to have like a, a common root certificate that is used to sign the intermediate cert on each side that is then used to sign this uh, certificate used by each proxy. So that's really like federation of identity. So you see just like the trust domain and you know having like a common root cert and all these things 
it's very complex already. Like it's a lot of things you have to do. And it's only one thing, one of the challenge. Then you need to define how the, the services communicate together. So here you see it goes through the edge gateway, but it's not like native. You have to, this, this pod by default is not aware at all that there is another service here. So you need to create uh, multiple configuration, multiple you know, you objects, Istio objects to allow this communication. Then you need to find a way to manage access control globally because all the capability you get natively in Istio are just like um, based on you know, the fact that you have one mesh. And you have multiple other challenges and each one, each challenge is highly complex to solve. So that's why at solo.io, we uh, launched this project called uh, Service Mesh Hub, which is an open source project. And uh, the idea of the Service Mesh Hub is that it comes with this notion of a virtual mesh. So you create a virtual mesh on Service Mesh Hub and you specify the mesh you want to target. And uh, it will do the, it will federate the identity so, you know, create this root cert and sign the intermediate certificate and all these things. It will do all this complex stuff for you. And then when you have this virtual mesh in place, you can create some uh, traffic policies and access policies to determine which service need, how, how one service can talk to another service and which service is allowed to talk to another service. And you, you just create this high level abstraction and service mesh hub will translate that in uh, Istio objects. And here I take the example of Istio because that's, we started with, with, with Istio, but we already uh, uh, released the first, uh, you know, part of the support we want for uh, open service mesh. Uh, we are also working on uh, app mesh. So the idea is also to have this higher level of abstraction that will be translated in the corresponding object, depending on the technology you, you want to use. And also to allow you to have like cross cluster communication, even if you have different uh, mesh technologies. So I'm going to take an example because I'm going to do a demo. So in this example, you know, we use this book info application, which is like something you probably know if you already played with uh, Istio. Uh, which is like uh, based on several microservices. You have a front-end microservice that is called the product page that uh, then send requests to back-end microservices called reviews and details. And the reviews called another one called rating. And here, what we are going to do, we are going to show you how easy it is to allow this product page service, not only to talk to the review service running there locally, but also to talk to the review service running on the other cluster, on the other mesh. And you see the difference is that here I have only V1 and V2, while here I have V1, V2, and V3. And I, I'll show you that in a minute. And the idea is that I, in the demo, I've just created this very simple um, policy where I'll define uh, that all the requests that goes through that, that target the review service on this cluster. I want to send 75% of the request uh, on the other cluster on version three, 15% on the same cluster, like the local one on version one and 10% on ver version two on the local cluster. So very simple to define policies that way. And I'll show you that in the demo how it works. And then I'll show you uh, how I should have done that without service mesh hub. So the complexity that uh, it would be to do that uh, manually. So let me like jump on this demo environment. So in uh, in this demo environment, then uh, what uh, I have is, and I'm going to show you that very quickly here. So I have like uh, basically like three kind clusters. Each kind cluster has like a different name, like MGMT where I have service mesh up. It could run on the same as one of the Istio cluster, but just want to show it's not mandatory. And then I have one cluster one and one call cluster two. And I deployed Istio on these two clusters. And what I already did is that I already created uh, the virtual mesh we discussed before. And when I, def when I deployed Istio, you see I, I use different trust domain. You see cluster two here, cluster one here, so that 
uh, I get like different identities between my services. And then I, as I said, I, I created this virtual mesh. Let me show you here. Oops, just there. So the virtual mesh, very simple. You see, you define the two meshes you want to target. And then what I created is that uh, some access control, but we will go back to access control a little bit later. And here for the multi-cluster traffic, what I'm going to do now is to create this traffic policy that we have just seen before, but just the cluster name change. You see cluster one is the local and cluster two is the remote one. So I'm going to just like paste that here. And what I'm going to show, in fact, I will, I will even delete it first so that you see what's the current status before I create it. So this is the product page here. And you see when I refresh the page, sometimes I get black stars, which means that it's the version two, V2 of the reviews microservice. Sometimes I get no stars, which means I have a rich version one of this microservice. But even if I refresh many times, I never get the red stars, which is the version three because I didn't put in place my policy yet. So now let me try to test this policy that we described before. And if I refresh here, you see I already get the red star directly. And if I refresh several times, most of the time I will get like the red stars because I say 75% of the time I want to have the red stars. So very simple uh, way of doing it. But if I would do that uh, manually, I would need to do this kind of things. I would need to create a virtual service, an Istio virtual service, uh, where I define something similar to what I defined before, but with uh, this global global name, you know, finishing by global to, to instruct uh, Istio that it's not running locally. Then I would need to create a destination rule for that, that has all the subset defined there then I would need to create a service entry for the service that runs on the other cluster to make the local cluster aware of it. And then on the other cluster, I would need to have like an envoy filter to remove like the dot kind three dot global, or in my case, cluster two dot global, and to replace by cluster dot local, and then another destination rule for the subset and so on. So a lot of complexity that is replaced by just like this very simple traffic policy. And what's interesting as well uh, is something that we are launching uh, now is like this uh, UI that uh, allows you to basically have like an idea about what's going on in your mesh. So you see here, I have my virtual mesh with two meshes and I can see as well that um, I have like, uh, you know, these Istio versions running on each of them and I can see that uh, I created some policies. You know, this is a simple policy I just created here. And I can see which services are targeted by uh, this policy. And I can also define access policies. For example, here I allow the review service to talk to uh, the rating service. So to do that, basically I created something like that. I created an access policy where I say, the reviews running on cluster one or on cluster two is allowed to, to communicate with the rating service on whichever uh, site. And if I go to the UI here, I see that the rule is enforced, but I also see now in real time what pods are impacted by this rule. So if I start a new pod with you know the same service account, then I will see, see them there. So it's very convenient way to see you know what's going on. And you can like define failovers like I will discuss later. And when everything is running, you can even like use it to debug, you know, what have been created on Istio, you know, the different virtual services that have been created by Service Mesh Hub, you know, the service entries, you know, all this stuff to, you know, understand how Service Mesh Hub has translated your uh, high level rules in, in Istio objects and obviously as I said, uh, soon in uh, OSM or app mesh uh, objects. So that was an example for like uh, a traffic policy um, 
you know, to do like multi-cluster or cross-cluster communication, but uh, we can also use it for failover, for example. So we can say like, uh, uh, if I cannot reach this service locally, then I want to reach the one on the remote side. And again, you, you would have like uh, uh, high level abstraction service mesh up that, that makes that easy to implement. So that's, uh, that was just like a, a quick introduction to service mesh hub. Obviously um, you can go on our website to learn uh, more about that. But now what I want, so we started with like, you know, how we go from, you know, monolith to microservices, how we run our microservices on Kubernetes. Then uh, we went through how we expose these microservices, you know, with ingress or with an API gateway. And then we discussed about the service to service communication. And we, we discussed about the, the, the service mesh in general and the different options there, the challenges, and then how you do like cross cluster communication with service mesh. And now let's talk about the future. You know, what's next, you know, what's coming and what's very interesting to, 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 to look at. So the, the, the next thing is really WebAssembly. And I'm sure you already heard about it. So WebAssembly was really uh, built for the browser so that you can run uh, some uh, functions that you don't want to write them in JavaScript for uh, performance reasons or for other reasons. Then you, you write like, uh, you, you create this web uh, assembly binary and, and you can have like a, a contract between JavaScript and this binary and you can, um, you can call some of the functions from, from your JavaScript in your browser. Um, but, WebAssembly, uh, uh, it has now been also like uh, implemented in Envoy. So the Envoy community has been working hard on that. Uh, we've been also very active on, on that side. And why, why that? Because if you think about Envoy and the way we create filters today. So if you are familiar with Envoy, uh, you probably know what it is. Otherwise, let, let me explain quickly. So let's say you have a request that comes to Envoy, then what if you want to um, modify this request in one way or another, you create filters. And uh, you have what we call a filter chain. So you can chain the filters one after the other so that one like modify header, the other one like check the, you know, under external authentication and, and so on. But today uh, you have to write these uh, filters in uh, C++ and you have to statically link them uh, in Envoy. So that means that you, you need to re, you, you really need to compile everything together and then you ship everything together. So it's really dynamic. Like, first of all, if you want to, to build your own filter, uh, you will need to use C++, which is not very convenient for uh, most of the people. And also when your filter is ready, then you cannot just say, okay, I want to push it to my Envoy that is running in production. You cannot do that. You will have really to replace that Envoy running in production by the new one that embed your filter. So it's definitely, uh, not easy. So companies like us, you know, with our product called Glue, you know, we build everything together, we write our filters and we do all these complex things for our customers. But you always have um, uh, cases where someone wants to do something very specific to his business logic. And it would be very convenient if they can write filter for that. But also because Envoy is running everywhere in the mesh, if I am able to write um, some codes, or easily some filters, then I could also have a way to alter the communication that happens between services. That gives a lot of possibilities. So what we did in, uh, in solo.io, we built, uh, we, we created these two projects, you know, one uh, was me and one that's called WebAssembly Hub. So the idea is really to make it easier for you to uh, build your um, your WebAssembly uh, filters and to deploy them. So basically, we have written uh, a few, a couple of SDKs, you know, C++, based on C++ and based on assembly script. Others have created uh, and um, provided like SDKs for uh, Rust or TinyGo. And we took all of them and basically we created this CLI that's called WASMI that allows you to really simply uh, decide which language you want to use 
then you write your, your codes uh, based on this language, and then you do have an experience that is very similar to Docker. So instead of a Docker build, you do a WASMI build, and it just builds your uh, WebAssembly uh, binary based on uh, the SDK you decided to use. And uh, in fact, it stored that in a OCI image, so the same format that uh, you find for, for Docker. Then you would do like a WASMI tag, like you would do a Docker tag so that you give a name to your filter. And then you would do like a WASMI push, like you would do a Docker push, so that you would push it in a what we call a WebAssembly hub. And then when you want now to use that uh, filter, you can just do like a WASMI deploy and it will just like uh, deploy that filter on Envoy. It can be Envoy running on Glue, Envoy running on Istio, Envoy running on any mesh uh, that is uh, different, but we started with Glue and with Istio uh, on the, the WASMI uh, CLI. So let me do a demo and uh, show you what, what you can do with that. So let me just go back to this environment we have here. And we have this uh, product page uh, like we described. And um, if I go a little bit down here, see my WASMI stuff there. If I try to see the headers, when I go to this product page, you see I get a 200 and you see the, the current headers I get. So uh, what I want is like this very simple filter that I want to implement that uh, add a new header called hello with the value world, but you can you could put uh, whatever else. I will not show you how you how you write the code. You know, as I said, you have different SDKs and it would take too much time. So what I did is that I already like uh, already created uh, one that is just based on the hello world example. And I already uh, installed the uh, WASMI CLI. So I should see, if I see WASMI, yeah, I should get it. So what I'm going to do now is that I'm going to, so I have several clusters, so I will do that for cluster one. And I should see here, my pods, and I see my product page and my two versions only that are like already in this cluster. And I'm going to do like a WASMI deploy. And you see very similar to, uh, so you see, I, I say Istio because I could do that on Glue, but here it's Istio. And then you see very similar to uh, when you use like a Docker image, the WebAssembly hub, which is like uh, the hub itself, uh, my username, the name of my filter and the version, the tag. And uh, that's the idea I want to use. And then here I can see, I can define what service I want to target. So here I want to target the product page only. So if I click there and hopefully if everything goes well, then we should have uh, it applied. And uh, currently, so normally um, if you use the latest version upstream of Envoy, uh, you don't uh, need to do anything. I mean, it doesn't, restart the uh, sidecar proxy because uh, you can load the filter uh, during runtime. But here you'll see that it has restarted that because the latest Istio version is not based on the latest upstream that uh, allows that. So that's why currently we restart, but imagine like next major Istio will be based on the Envoy version that can handle that without um, any restart. But um, yeah, so. Let me, as I said, it's still experimental. Sometimes we need to help it a little bit. So let me just restart because there is like a, also a cache we need to use to cache the, the filter before we can run it on Envoy because currently, again, with this version of Envoy that runs on this version of Istio, you, you have to mount that, uh, image, so that's why we restart the pod. But in the latest uh, um, version, you don't need to do that. It's just like you can you can just define directly. Basically, you can give it that information and it can pull it directly, which is a lot better. Um, so now what I want to do is just like see if I do a curl again. Where was my curl? OK, 
Okay. I don't know why I don't see it anymore. Anyway, so if I do a curl here, you see hello world. So that means that now my filter is loaded and you see how easy it was to, to deploy it. But that's still, you know, the request that goes from the outside world to Istio through the Istio Ingress Gateway. What if I want to do that for uh, east-west traffic? So it's easy. We will, in this case, we will target the uh, reviews microservice because this one is, to, is, is called by uh, the product page microservice. Again, I'm deploying the same way. And then I'm going to you do use kubectl exec to basically send a request from the product page to the reviews microservice and to print the headers. So again, I'm just going to look at my pods and see, yeah, it's already terminating. So that sounds good. Okay, you see the cache was, was okay this time, so I didn't have to kill it. And you see here, you don't see the hello world, right? Why, why I don't see the hello world is just because I still have my traffic policy in place. So 75% of the time it goes to the second site. And in this second site, in the reviews microservice, I didn't add this filter. But if I run it several times, like probably four times, I should start to see the hello worlds coming somewhere. Uh, do I see it somewhere? Perhaps I just miss it. No. Should come soon. Okay, I'm lucky. Okay, I don't know. It's fine. I, I, I would not spend too much time on it, but you, you get the idea. Uh, basically, uh, you can uh, use it for um, a filter that you want to use to transform the uh, uh, request coming from the outside world to the ECO um, ingress gateway. But you can also use it uh, to alter the communication or to modify the request that uh, goes from one service to another service. So I think I am like, yeah have some time after for some questions. So I really recommend a few things. First of all, this blog post uh, on our website uh, that you see here that really explain more about you know, WebAssembly and the current state. Uh, Christian Posta and, uh, and Yuval uh, Koavi from uh, our teams have done a good job to explain how it works and to explain the limitation, to explain why it's not ready for production yet what's uh, what's next things coming and op hopefully we'll be able to to use that in production very soon but it's really uh, something I recommend you to 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 read and um, you know I mean like um, as I said it's it's upstream now uh, in envoy I think it's uh, I pasted when it was two days ago but it's like two weeks ago now so it's it's quite new but things are moving very fast there are still a few things that need to happen before you can really use it in production, but uh, but that should definitely be uh, very soon. So I kept some time for uh, question and answers. Uh, I think there was one, but uh, Betty already replied. So I don't know if we have other questions coming. Feel free to ask your question now. We have uh, some time to to answer them. Sorry, I was on mute there. So yeah, for, so for the first question there um, was about um, Surface Mesh Hub and if that's open source or if it's a solo project. So, so the Service Mesh Hub is an open source project and uh, all the capabilities I have uh, shown in the demo, like uh, being able to handle uh, traffic across clusters, federate the identity, uh, you know, failover that I discussed about, everything is, is open source. Uh, the only thing, only thing that I have shown that uh, is not going to be open source is the, the UI that uh, I have used to show you the policy I've created. So that's UI. 
um, is not part of the open source version. And we are going to have like an enterprise version with this UI, but also with some uh, additional capabilities like being able to define airbag uh, about you know, who, who can define what kind of policies and, and, and many other interesting things. Uh, but definitely uh, you can use a service mesh up the open source version and you can get uh, all the benefits I described in the demo with this. Yeah, and a follow on to that is, um, you know, if, um, you know, who's contributing, who's involved. Um, this is definitely an active um, open source project from this, um, from Solo um, internally, but um, there is a we bi-weekly community meeting and we've had other other vendors um, that are involved with service mesh participating um, to make sure that this can work with um, their mesh, their meshes, um, as well as you know just other fo other um, general community members and users um, who are um, involved, uh, you know, make suggestions or um, have PRs. Um, and another question here from Tony is: Is Service Mesh Hub considered production ready? Um, and then I, this I, is oh, go ahead. Yeah, no, I mean, like, uh, it's, we are going to GA the enterprise version. And at that time, we would consider like service mesh hub in general to be GA. But I mean, it's, it's coming very soon. And, uh, and I assume that someone who would start today to, um, to, to, to look at service mesh hub and start to implement it and try it out and so on. Uh, by the time it will be ready to go in production. Uh, we will consider that also ready for production. But but right now, I mean, you could already use it in production. I mean, it's uh, it's um, it has all the uh, features that you need for that. Obviously, it's quite new, so uh, you need to do some extensive testing, probably based on your use case and based on your environment. Uh, but definitely, um, uh, it's it's already. Uh, quite mature and it's something we will consider really production ready very soon, especially as soon as you will uh, start to, to, to see us like communicating about uh, the enterprise version and the, the GA. Yeah, and so for some context for folks, um, Service Mesh Hub was originally launched um, in May of 2019 at actually KubeCon Europe, back when we used to have conferences um, at locations <laughs> in real life. Um, and then this spring, what we did is um, we did a major update to it as well as open sourced it. So the open sourcing is just this year, but it is something that's been around for um, 18 months now. And working with um, end users and customers ha um, has been the definition and addition of um, additional features um, specific specifically to help with uh, security and scale um, for the enterprise use case. So and that's really what Dennis is talking about, what's coming soon. Do we have any, any other question? But, but you know, as Betty said, you know, we have uh, our Slack channel. Uh, you can register and we have like a service mesh hub uh, um, channel here. And, uh, you know, you can ask questions, like give feedback, um, ask, you know, like if you try it and you are stuck, like we're happy to help. Uh, if you want to contribute, you are more than welcome as well. Yeah, you know. you're welcome to join in the, the repos. Um, both Dennis and I are also um, are in the CNCF Slack um, and you'll find us there. You'll find us at the upcoming KubeCon virtual. Um, and then we also have a solo Slack as well for, you know, like, that's where primarily the um, these project discussions happen. Good. That that Thanks looks, everyone. Yeah, and that looks like that's it for today. Thanks everybody. Um, and we will see you all in a few weeks at KubeCon. See you, bye-bye.